folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're talking about the day of the Lord being at hand. Neat symbolism concerning the hand. Um, there are 27 bones in this hand. Of course, there's 27 bones in this hand. And um, this hand, right hand, represents the strength and power and so on. The, the day of the Lord is at hand. The literal meaning of that means within reach, within grasp. Uh, if something is at hand, hey, this pencil is at hand. Um, but there are 27 books in the New Testament. And that's not an accident. It's not something that God went, wow, I didn't, didn't realize that when I was putting all that together. There's a purpose in everything. When you see Jacob lay his hand upon Manasseh and Ephraim, um, you know, the hands crossed like that. That represents giving them the right hand blessing. Um, Paul talked about the right hand of fellowship and so on. And it all represents the new covenant and what God, how God is going to save people by his mighty right hand. There's a simpler understanding of it, and you've been looking at it all this time. Uh, we say, hey, give me five. All right, so we use our hands. We don't use our feet to do it. We use our hands to do it. So one of the meanings of the hand, the symbolism of it, is the number five, because God gave us five fingers all together. So you, you think about that, the day of the Lord being at hand, or the hand being a symbol of the Lord's return. Um, Moses' hand was in his bosom, right? He takes it out of his bosom and it's full of leprosy, white like snow. That's Christ who is in the bosom of the Father and he comes the first time. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Though his sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So then he returns to the Father to make atonement for that sin and when he comes again, just like Moses taking his hand out of his bosom, I love this stuff. He's taking his hand out of his bosom again. This time, it's like his other hand. There's no leprosy. It's because when Jesus comes the second time, he's coming without sin, okay, to, to reign over the earth. Anyway, we've been talking about the number five and the translation. And we get this. We started out with 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain. There's five things here. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul said, Behold, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Then he said, For the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So it's about us being caught up into heaven, but it's also about us being transformed into our new bodies. Some who, have, who are asleep now, who are sleeping the sleep of death, they are going to be changed, but we who are alive are going to be transformed into this new body without ever seeing death, without ever tasting death. And you know, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, a believer in His Word, I'm happy with either one. Because if I die before the Lord returns, I get to go to heaven before everybody else, maybe a, like a billionth of a microsecond ahead of everybody else, still get to go first. Dead in Christ shall rise first. But if I'm alive and remain, then I still get to go and be transformed into that new body, get to be with Jesus uh, forever. If you follow uh, the patterns of the Bible, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's about our transformation. But then if we get into chapter 5, five chapters of 1 Thessalonians, he talks about, you, you, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And that's the place where it says, For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So no matter where you stand on this issue, um, and, and again, I'm not using these words of the scripture to try to go to war against anybody or against anybody's ideology or their doctrinal statement or whatever it is, however they stand on the rapture issue. I want to bring these words to you 
the way the Bible says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And I, but I think we could all agree that God definitely has not appointed any of us unto his wrath. So beyond everything else, God is going to save his people from the wrath that is coming. And I'm satisfied with that. We looked at the typology of the two men in the Bible uh, who are the two witnesses of the fact that God can take people from this world and put them in heaven, the other world, without dying. The first person that did that was Enoch. Where do we find about Enoch? We find about Enoch in Genesis chapter, guess what? Five. Enoch was translated. He was taken from this world into heaven. We know that because of Hebrews 11, verse 5, that he saw, he didn't see death. He was translated from this world to the next without dying. So we have Enoch. We have association with the number five. And remember last time I told you that we were going to study Elijah. So I hope you did. Let's go to um, 2 Kings is where my notes say we're going to go. But I'm remembering something that I don't have in my notes. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 1. I want you to notice something. That we have uh, Elijah being translated into heaven in chapter 2. Before Elijah is translated, he encounters three groups of men, soldiers, that have, come, that have been sent by um, uh, Ahaziah the king. And um, Ahaziah the king, is, he's fell through a lattice and he's dying. And he wants to inquire of Elijah on whether or not he's going to die or not. Okay? First he goes to uh, inquires of Baalzebuth, okay, or Baalzebub. We know who that is, don't we? Okay, and um, but then uh, they he sends men to Elijah, and he sends them in three groups. If you notice in verse ten, First Kings, we have and Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty. We have fifty men coming out to ask Elijah. Okay, and they're consumed. Then in verse twelve. Uh, we have another group of 50 men. See, it's 5, 50, 500, 5,000. Okay? Um, yeah, I, I love it. Then we have another group in verse 13. He sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50. The captain of the 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of... These fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burned up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. The angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he rose and went down with him unto the king. So we have the total 50, 50, 50. We have 150 men that come before Elijah, right before Elijah, is translated into heaven. Now, I want you to remember that number. If you studied Elijah, you know that when Elijah is translated, there is a group of men who are the sons of the prophets who witness his translation. All right? And again, it is the number five in the form of the, of the number 50. All right? So let's pick it up. Here's my notes, 2 Kings chapter 2. Verse 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Very important, remember that, I underlined it. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind 
into heaven. So notice that we have Elisha, Elijah. We have two groups of men. Elisha represents, I believe, the people of Israel. When Elijah finds Elisha the very first time, if you go back to, what would it be, uh, 1 Kings, when Elijah found him the very first time, do you know what Elisha was doing? He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. The Bible doesn't just throw these numbers at you as if they're meaningless. Is it just random? Well, he had about 12 or it doesn't matter. 12 is a number for Israel and God's promised Israel. It goes back to Genesis chapter 12. He said, I will make, you know, I will bless thee. Uh, uh, I got to read it. Got to read it so I get it right. Uh, Genesis 12. He said many, many things to Abraham. That's why I'm not remembering exactly this one. Here we go. Genesis 12. I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And Paul told us that that blessing coming out of Abram was the Lord Jesus Christ. So, we have Elisha, his association with the number 12, 12 tribes of Israel. We have Elijah. And Elijah, watch this picture. We have two groups of people that God deals with. He deals with Israel and he deals with the Gentiles. Now, Israel, stubborn, bullheaded, hard-hearted, turned their back on God. God wrote him a bill of divorce, said, I'm done with you. I'm going to go find me some Gentiles. And so he found some Gentiles that believe his word, trust him like Abraham does. So we'd be given the faith of Abraham. We'd be given the blessing of Abraham. That's us Gentiles. We're going to be caught up into heaven. Israel then is going to receive, after we're gone, the liberty, the glorious liberty. They're going to, their eye, the veil of Moses is going to be lifted, all right? They're not going to be partially blinded anymore. They're going to see with full sight. God is going to bless his people and he's going to give them his Holy Spirit, his spirit being poured out twice. Once on the day of Pentecost, so we're going to go there in a minute. The second time when Christ translates us, he's going to give Israel the double portion of their spirit because he said here, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And Elijah said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. So Israel is not going to receive that outpouring of the Holy Spirit until when? He sees us waving by, okay? So 50 sons of the prophets see this, that number 50. Then Elijah's taken up into heaven, how? Whirlwind, get to him, get to him, okay? What does that remind you of? Acts chapter two, here's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Verse one, and when the day of Pentecost, what does Pentecost mean? 50 days, and this is the fifth book of the New Testament. Remember, stop right here. Remember what we found out last week. Christ ascended into heaven in what book? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Fifth book of the New Testament. And the angel said he's going to come again in like manner. He's coming in the clouds and that's where we're going to meet the dead in Christ. We're going to rise up after them and meet them in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So when Jesus comes in the clouds, we're going to be with him on that day, all right? I love this stuff. So, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I love it. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Again, Pentecost equals 50 days. So we have this number five once again, relevant to um, the sons of the prophets, who watch Elijah taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. The 50th day after Passover, Christ's death, uh, we have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And once again, we hear that sound of the rushing mighty wind. And it's associated with that exact same number, the number 50. So again, when you're studying the scriptures, you see something five or 50 or 500 or 
How many people did Jesus feed? Five thousand. The Bible says that there was only there was five thousand men, and it didn't count the women and children. Why not? They got to eat, right? But the Bible wanted you centered on that one number, five thousand. And do you remember what happened after everybody was fed? They gathered up the fragments that none be lost. How many baskets did they gather? Twelve. It's the gathering of the nation of Israel and the twelve tribes in the last days when he fed five thousand people. You see, when we're translated, God's going to restore Israel. So when you see these stories, whether they point to the blessing restored to Israel, salvation restored to Israel, whatever it is, here they are hungry and they're starving and Jesus has compassion on them and he feeds them. That's Israel now and Christ is going to feed them. So whatever story it is, it's going to point you to the uh, translation to Gentiles or like things like the wedding or the restoration of Israel, giving them the spirit or feeding them or just God being nice to Israel again, usually associated with 550, 500, 5,000. Uh, but then also a transformation either of God's people from, from death to life or a transformation like, with, like we found out last week, like with Satan transformed into Lucifer, an angel of light. And when he says the five things, the fifth one is, I will be like the Most High. He's seeking to take over what has been promised to us as an inheritance. All right? So, dealing with this number 50, so we have 50 of the, we have, we have 150 showing up to Elijah before he's translated. Remember that number. Then we have 50 of the sons of prophets watching Elijah taken up and Elisha receiving the double portion of the Holy Spirit. Then we have the 50 days of Pentecost where that spirit is poured out. And then I want you to remember the sermon that Peter preached on that day because it is relevant too to what we're studying. So Pentecost means 50. Then we find another significant 50 in the Bible. Leviticus 25. Let's see, 25 is five times. Leviticus 25 verse 8. Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Stop right here. The what sound? The trumpet. What did Paul say? What? Twice. He said, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Then he said, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. I love it. So we have a trumpet sounding. What is the trumpet significant of? It's the voice of Jesus. When John was in the spirit on the Lord's day, you heard a voice behind him as of a trumpet. It's the word. It's the word of God sounding. So the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month, the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Verse 10, you shall hallow, here it is, the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a Jubilee unto you and you shall return every man unto his possession and you shall return every man unto his family. Look what's happening here. And Jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself uh, in it, neither gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. I love this. God is a God who loves just giving away stuff, like salvation and possessions. In, in the old days, in Israel, God, God had a plan for helping people out. People get into debt, don't they? I got into bad debt and could not pay it back. 
And then somebody showed up and said, Mike, I'll pay it. No, no, I can't. Mike, you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. If you don't pay this debt, the punishment is going to be greater than what you can withstand. Mike, I'll pay the debt. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I realized one day I was morally and spiritually bankrupt and owed a debt that I could not pay and one step forth to pay my debt. And that one was, of course, Jesus Christ. Okay? So, in, in the, according to the law, if you owed a debt and to, to somebody, they took your land as payment and then probably took you as a servant. So the land had to bring forth increase. You had to serve and your wages were garnished and kept to the one you owed the debt to. In the 50th year, didn't matter. It didn't matter. When you, you accrued the debt, whether it's 48 years ago or a year ago, on the, every 50th year when they blew the trumpet at that exact moment, Whoever owned you and whoever owned your possession gave it back just like that. That was the law. You were released from the debt. You were free from your master's house and the inheritance that was handed down to you from your father was now yours once again. And that, I mean, we know what that is. It is our debt and the devil owns us. And Christ came and makes us free. He gives us perfect. In fact, James called the New Testament the perfect law of liberty. See, I've been made free. I've been in bondage before. I probably put other people in bondage with stupid things that I said. But I'm free now. Free is better than being in bondage. Free is better than being cheap. I like being free, and I like for God's people to... I do not like to see people in bondage. I do not like that. I do not like people being, being drawn away into stupid cults that put them in bondage and chains of do this, perform this, say this the right way, or you're not, you're not really saved. I don't like that kind of stuff. I think God put it in us to want to be free. Now, I just don't understand people who just enjoy bondage. I don't know. I don't get it. But anyway, 50th year, everybody's free. And he used the word liberty. Liberty. That's a New Testament biblical doctrine, of the law of liberty given to us by Christ in the New Covenant. Romans 8, 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Look at the heading here, liberty. The word liberty found in 25 verses of the Bible, exactly five times five. Isn't it cool? I love this. And, and when you look at this verse, he's going he's gonna to deliver us from the bondage of the corruption, which is this smelly body, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. When we receive our new body, we're going to float. We're going to go through walls. We're going to travel through space in a moment of time. We're going to be absolutely free from any bondage, from anything that weighs us down, from anything that would hinder us because of that new body. Oh, wow. Science fiction never dreamed up anything better and the resurrection of the saints. Amen? Now look at 2 Corinthians. Look at, look, at how, look at the wording of Paul here. He's telling you about when we are translated, God's going to restore the double portion to Israel once again. He's going to give them their liberty. The jubilee year associated with the number 5, the number 50, the trumpet sounding. Okay? 2 Corinthians 3.15 but even unto this day, when Moses, which he wrote five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. 
let me stop right here. Remember that Moses and the five books represent death. Number five, that's from our first video on this. This is, I think, the third. The first video on this, we dealt with the number five being a number for death. In the book of, books of Moses are the law of sin and death. Here's Adam. As in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. So, they're reading Moses right now, and they're all dying. Every one of them die, and they're lost because they read Moses. They don't understand. They don't... They don't accept it by faith, they've perverted it and twisted it with the Kabbalah, okay? So they have no faith, they have no grace on them, and they all die. So, verse 16, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into this. Look at that. Are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is so beautiful. Watch this. Here is, let's do it like this. Let's go to the very beginning. Here's the New Testament, okay? What, a single portion of the Spirit. double portion of the Spirit. You see it? Because the Spirit is the Word. The Word. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit, they are life. He's going to conquer the Antichrist with the Spirit that comes out of his mouth, which is his Word, the sword of the Word of God, which is uh, the Spirit of God. And so, anyway, when, when, when all of this turns to the Lord, the veil is going to be taken away. And when they read now, they're going to understand that it's Jesus their Christ, their Lord, their Messiah. They're going to be given the Spirit of the Lord and they're going to be given liberty. And we are going to be changed, just like us looking at our opposite in the mirror, we're going to be changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And think about it, the Spirit of the Lord, uh, things that are double. You have two noses, two, well, two nostrils, right? You have two lungs where your spirit is, and it delivers the air to the body, just like Old Testament, New Testament. So Israel receives that double portion and receives their liberty, finally. Finally, the land, the inheritance is theirs. And it's going to be theirs for keeps. And then we, at that same time, are going to be changed transformed from this glory to the next glory, right? Because think of the Old Testament shining, Moses' face shining when he comes down, and yet the Lord shines brighter than that, the new covenant. Let's keep moving. First Kings chapter 18, look at this, okay? Um, God's protection of his people. Remember, in 1 Thessalonians 4, the five things happen, were changed, and then 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night, and uh, God has not appointed us unto wrath. So there is a protection order given at the translation where God is going to hide his people and keep them. 1 Kings 18. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the year, in the third year, saying, Go shew thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to shew himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them how? By fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water, hid them by 50. Then you remember when Elizabeth, Baron Elizabeth, she has a baby, and when she finds out that she's pregnant, it's John the Baptist, right? In Luke chapter 1, verse 24, and after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself 
five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Right now, there is a reproach on Israel. She is a barren woman who cannot bring forth. But one of these days, God is going to have mercy on her. And she's finally going to bring forth. And Elizabeth was a picture of that. Here we have John the Baptist coming first. And then Christ coming after him. Old Testament, New Testament. So Elizabeth, barren Elizabeth, finally conceives. And when she finds out she conceives, what does she do? She hides herself. Months. Do you know how many days that is? Okay, hold on to that. Just hold on to it for a minute. Five-month time prophecy given to you in the Bible. It's found in more places than just Luke chapter 1. Okay, very, I think, very relevant, very important. I think that our translation and the reason why it's so bound up and symbolized with this exact same number, five, whether it's five, fifty, five hundred, five thousand, doesn't matter. I think the reason why that it is points us to a very particular time prophecy in the Bible. It's not seven years, it's not three and a half years. It's five months, okay? Now, I can't, I can't take that and say, it's going to happen right here. I can't do it. All I know is the patterns that I see in the Bible, the numbers that keep coming up, whether they are explicitly mentioned in the text of the Scripture or they're ordered that way. Either way, I can't escape this conclusion that I personally have made. You don't have to make the same conclusion. You, we're, we are at liberty. We are using these things to comfort one another, not beat one another over the head. Like, oh, you Hoggard, you're an idiot because you believe this. I can't help what I believe. This is obviously how God has directed me, right or wrong. It belongs to God, and I'm comfortable with that. And it's all I know. I don't know anything, haven't seen anything beyond that. I see through a glass darkly like everybody else does. One of these days, God's going to show you and me not how right I was or how right you were, but how right this is, okay? And I learn it more and more every day. So let God be true and everybody named Mike Hoggard a liar. And everybody named whatever your name is, a liar. But facts being facts, numbers being numbers, symbols being symbols, I think this is what it's leading to. All right? A five-month time prophecy. Uh, remember, the day of the Lord is at hand. One, two, three, four, five. I think it's a very simple reminder of the timing of the day of the Lord. And once again, the restoration of blessing to Israel. And that blessing comes in various ways, whether it comes through having a baby or it comes from being fed or it comes from something very important to Israel was the former and the latter reigns because that had to do with everything to do with harvest. If they don't get the former rains, they, don't, they can't plant, and if, if they plant, it's going to die. If they don't get the latter rains, then they can't harvest because what, what they intend to harvest dries up. So they need the former rain. And they, think of it like this, former rain, latter rain, okay? The latter days. Here's the latter rain. So Israel needs that rain, don't they? So we go back to Elijah again, and there's a story in here about Elijah restoring rain. 1 Kings chapter 18. 
and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and, and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time. Let me stop right here. The seventh time, when it's seven, it's final. It's over with, it's done. Um, look at Revelation 10. I've turned here a lot. We have another mighty angel come down from heaven. He's clothed with a cloud. His face is as a rainbow upon his head. Maybe it's Jesus. I think it's Jesus. I can't, I can't escape that one either. Okay. And then look what happens. Verse 4. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven the things that therein are and the earth that, and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice, the voice of the seventh angel and it's the trumpet when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So think of right here the seventh trumpet the mystery is over and God's, God's going to do everything that he declared to his servants, the prophets. The mystery, part of that mystery we, we know from scripture is, uh, Paul said, don't be ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened to Israel till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So we know that the scales are going to come off Israel's eyes, the veil's going to be lifted, the light of Christ is going to shine upon them, they're going to get revelation, they're going to get the double portion of the Spirit. God's doctrine is going to fall upon them like the rains, like the former and the latter rains. So, the servant goes seven times. And the seventh time, what does he see? Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Now, here's what's funny. I used to think that that said the size of a man's hand. The newer translation, some of them do. But that's not what it says. He said, there arise a little cloud out of the sea like, what? There's <laughs> a cloud coming, <laughs> right? The day of the Lord is that hand. And what's going to happen? The rains are going to come. God's going to di uh, distill his doctrine. His doctrine's going to come down from heaven like the, like the former and the latter rains. Okay? It didn't say the size of a man's hand. It says, like a man's hand. Behold, he cometh in the clouds. Oh, I love this. Love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Because, so here we have the day of Pentecost, which is 50. And Peter then, and I told you to think about this, Peter then preaches the sermon. And he says, this, they're all speaking in other tongues. And he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he begins to quote Joel chapter 2. And Joel, um, all of it, 1, 2, and 3, is about the day of the Lord. And the events that occur at the time when there is the bridegroom and the bride. That's mentioned in Joel chapter 2. There's also another, there's a nation, a mighty nation mentioned in, in Joel, in the book of Joel. Joel chapter 1, Joel chapter 2 gives their description. We're going to talk about them in a minute and the relationship between the number 5 and transformation. But Peter's quoting Joel chapter 2, and he said, you know, this is going to happen. There's going to be signs and wonders from heaven. These things are going to happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he says, whosoever, you know, at that day, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered, is what Joel said. Saved is what uh, Peter said. They both mean the same thing. So let's count the things that Peter and Joel said were going to happen on that day. Acts chapter 2, verse 19, And I will shew wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood, number one, and fire, number two, vapor of smoke, number three, number four, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and number five, and the moon into blood 
Look at it. Before that great and notable day of the Lord come. One, two, three, four, five things happen before that day. Not on that day, not after that day, before that day. Five things happen. Blood, fire, vapor of smoke, sun turned into darkness, moon into blood. How many times have you seen in the Bible prophecies of the sun being darkened, the moon turned to blood, or the moon being darkened, and the stars falling? Okay? Starting in Joel chapter 2, I have verse 2 up on the screen, but I want us to look, I, I want to look at verse 1. Because I think verse 1 really sets the tone here for what I'm setting you up for. Joel chapter 2, verse 1, blow you the trumpet. It's what we're waiting to hear in Zion. Sound an alarm. That was the purpose for the trumpet. It was to sound the alarm. The enemy's coming. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. There it is. So that sets the tone for what he's sounding the alarm for and the signs and the wonders that are going to be in later on in Joel chapter 2 where the sun is dark and the moon turned to blood and those five things that happen. Those things happen before the great notable day of the Lord and a nation comes to the earth. Where are they coming from? What are they going to do? If you follow the New Apostolic Reformation, you follow that, all, that signs and wonders crowd, they'll lead you to believe that God is going to supercharge the Christians and He's going to transform them. He's going to change their DNA. They talk about they're a new breed, a new seed. They're going to be a super race of Christians. They're going to be Joel's mighty army in Joel chapter 2. And I, re I read it and I'm going, uh-uh, that ain't me. That's not us. That might be them. But I want no part of it. Let's look at it. Joel chapter 2, verse 2. We read verse 1. Let's read verse 2. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and, and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Look at this. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. And as horsemen, so shall they run, like the noise of chariots on the top. What is it that picked, uh, it, what separated Elijah and Elisha? Like the noise of chariots on the tops of, the, of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Now, who are these people? Here's a little bit more description of them in Joel chapter 1, verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, that which the locust hath left hath the cankerworm eaten, and that which the cankerworm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Let's stop right here. We count. We have palmer worm, locust, cankerworm, caterpillar. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Fourth kingdom. But one of them he's mentioning specifically as locusts. So let's pick it up in verse 5. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine. For it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Now, let's add some of this together. We're going to go to Joel chapter 2. They have the appearance of horses and horses. They have the noise of chariots. They're like a flame of fire, and they're set in battle array. They got battle stuff on, okay? Uh, they're not playing tennis. They're going to battle. All right? Then, like locusts, and then like their teeth are the cheek teeth of lions. So in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Joel, we're given a pretty good description of this nation. And I believe the literalness of the scripture. Are these symbolic? Well, of course they are. Everything in the Bible is. Are they literal? You can't tell me they're not. They are literal. Because God said it. And God doesn't lie. God doesn't make stuff up. God doesn't say, well, I said they're like lions, but they're really not lions. Yeah, I said they look like locusts. They're not, they're not really locusts. Okay? I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. I just reading the Bible, I believe exactly to the letter what it says. 
So then I take that description of this army that comes before the great and notable day of the Lord. Before this army comes. What is this army? Revelation 9. And the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Stop right here. You know where I'm going, don't you? I got to. Isaiah 14, fifth trumpet, right? I saw a star fall from heaven. Isaiah 14, 12, how art thou fallen from heaven? Same words. I saw a star fall from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer. Remember him from last week? Not morning star, not day star, that's Jesus. Lucifer, because Lucifer means light bearer, and so does messenger of light or angel of light. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11. Because Satan is transformed into an angel of light. And Satan, or Lucifer, wants five things. I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north, that's Mount Zion. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds where we are. I will be like the most high. He wants, again, he wants what we're going to get, but he needs an army. He thinks he has to have an army with him to destroy Jesus Christ and the one who would receive the inheritance on our behalf. If we destroy, Je if we kill Jesus, we can get the inheritance. I can get the throne. That's what he seeks, and it's five things. That's what the pentagram is all about. So we take that back to this, the same connection here in Revelation and the fifth trumpet sounds and lo and behold, a star is falling from heaven. But before he falls, Jesus is going, hey, Lucifer, Satan, see the key? I got the key. You want it? Want it? Huh? Want it? Got to beg for it. Come on. You want it? Want it? And he gives him the key. And the dragon, Satan, Lucifer, never goes, what are you giving me this? You're setting me up, aren't you? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm smarter than that. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna open that up. Uh, uh there's no way. Satan, the dragon, he's a beast, and he just does what he was made to do. Throw a stick in front of a dog, and the dog's gonna go chasing after it. It's all there is to it. Dangle the key in front of the dragon, and the dragon's gonna grab it. He's gonna be thrown out of heaven. He's falling. And immediately he takes the key. Look at what it says. Verse 2, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened. Think Joel. Think Acts chapter 2. One of the five things that were going to happen, the sun was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts. That's what we saw in Joel chapter 1. Upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. In verse 7, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared into battle. That's Joel 2. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. What is it? Stop right here. What are we to not be afraid of? The faces of men. See, it doesn't just apply to like I'm preaching and people are going. They're all mad at me, which that does bother me. It's not just that. It's these guys. And we're not to be afraid of them because they have the power and the strength of locusts, right? What does Jesus give us the power to tread upon? Scorpion, scorpions. Did I say locusts while ago? I meant scorpions. Gives us the power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. And against all the power of the enemy, it's not going to have any effect on us. So he says, don't be afraid of the faces of men. And don't be afraid of the scorpions. And don't be afraid of the serpents. Because I'm going to give you power to tread on them. And may the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Mm. Anyway, they had the faces of men. They had the hair as the hair of women. 
And their teeth, look at here, their teeth were as the teeth of lions. That's Joel chapter 1. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. That's Daniel chapter 2, the iron kingdom. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. That's Joel chapter 2. And they had tails like an scorpions, and their stings were in their tails, and their power was to hurt men. There it is. Five months. Five months. Elizabeth hit herself. The um, Obadiah hid the servants, the prophets, by fifties, hid them. You see it? These scorpions come out and they hurt men exactly the same amount of time. Five months. Okay? There's more to this than I'm going to show you. There's, there's a time prophecy related to this. Because what these scorpions have and what's so dangerous about them is their sting. Their sting, they sting all the people and strike all the people on the earth. And all the people on the earth up until this time wanted immortality. And that's what we're hearing right now from Ray Kurzweil, from the transhumanists, from everybody. Let's cure all the diseases. Let's make it, make it so that no one dies. Let's break the curse of the Garden of Eden. So, scorpions come out, strike everybody on the earth, and man gets what he wants. And for five months, not a single human being dies, not one. But at some point during that time, men change their mind. And they want death. And it won't show up. They seek death. It, they cannot find it. All because the scorpions and their what? Sting. Did you know that God has made us immune to the sting of death? 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Five. See, I can't make this stuff up. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And 1 Corinthians 15 and the 50s verses is all about the translation. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So for five months, Everybody else, they're stung, we're immune. Sting of death has no place on us. Amen? Back to Joel chapter 2, because Peter mentioned, he preached it. The sun should be darkened, the moon should be turned into blood. It's from Joel chapter 2, verse 10. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Notice that the earth is quaking, the heavens are going to tremble. And the sun and moon is going to be darkened, and the stars are going to withdraw their shining. In other passages where it talks about this, it mentions that the star, some of the stars fall. So in Matthew 24, take note, verse 29, immediately after what? The tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man, here it is, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is, now, I, and I know, I know that it breaks some of the charts that have been drawn, that it violates certain doctrinal ideas, that it messes with thoughts that, we've, that I've had in the past about when the translation is going to be. Because some say, oh, it's, it's after the tribulation. Oh, no, it's before the tribulation. We don't endure any tribulations. Wrath. We don't go through wrath. And then there's this argument about seven years and three and a half years and this and that and the other. And I'm just, 
I just have to stay with what I see in the scriptures. That there is a time of sorrow coming. For a period of time related to the number five. You, you probably guessed it. I mean, I've just about said it. That we will endure, but we will be saved through that. And at the end of that, translated, receiving that glorious new body, being totally free from all the trappings and the vanity of this world, okay, happening. The sun is darkened. The moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. That's what he said in Joel. The heavens shall tremble. If, if you want to look at another passage that says that in Revelation 6, and beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. That's what he says in Joel 2.10. The earth shall quake before them. And uh, the sun became black as sackcloth. There it is. And the moon became as blood. There it is. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as the fig tree cast their untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. That's exactly what they heard in Acts chapter 2. They were hearing prophecy of a mighty wind that was going to shake the heavens, shake the earth, and things are going to fall. And remember what Paul said, there shall come a falling away first. Then that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And those things happen before the day of Christ when we are gathered together unto the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he said in Matthew 24. He's going to send his angel. You know what? You know what it was that came down and parted Elijah and Elisha? It was angels. Angels. There are a group of angels in the Bible. Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10. Uh, Psalm, can't remember where it is, but the chariots of the Lord are uh, 20,000, even thousands of angels. So here he sends his angels probably looking like chariots, to gather together his elect. We are going to be gathered together to gather with the dead in Christ, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe it's going to happen exactly the way the Bible says it's going to happen. And I can't see every little detail. Nor can I answer every little question. I just know that God led me to this, I mean, years ago. And I've tried to challenge it as best as I could with the Word of God. Not with somebody's charts, not with somebody's book, but with the Word of God. And I still keep coming back to the same conclusion. I have more of this, not anywhere near done. But I'm going to stop right here. It's a good stopping point. It's going to be a marriage. Amen? It's going to be a wonderful wedding. He's the bridegroom. We're the bride. And that's what we're going to look at. It's going to be related to this number five. So we're in, we ended Matthew 24. Go to the next chapter, which is five times five. 25, okay? I love you. I hope that these words, either today or tomorrow, can be comforting to you, okay? To know that no matter what we go through, no matter how bad the enemy surrounds us, no matter how bad the storm gets, no matter if the stars fall from heaven, God is never, ever, ever going to forget His people whom He foreknew, okay? Let that be your comfort. Let it be your comfort even today. As God saves you through things and times that you're going through right now. Because the God who's going to do all of these things is the same God who's doing these things in your life right now. Okay? So let it be a comfort to you. You're the reason why 
I sit here and do what I do, okay? And it's a pleasure to bring this to you, to bring these words to you. I hope they're a comfort. I hope they're a blessing. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.